pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Need any digging done in your garden? Here's the granddaddy of all power shovels that could take the topsoil off a good-sized city lot in one swoop. The cab is a mere eight stories tall, while the dipper holds 45 cubic yards. At this Hannah Coal Company strip mine in eastern Ohio, the giant shovel clears about a million cubic yards of overburden a month from the top of buried veins of coal. That king-size digging machine came from here, at the Marion Power Shovel Company of Marion, Ohio. None of the other equipment these men produce is quite as big as the one in use at the Hanna Pits, but they're all pretty good size. Here, for example, an excavator part is machined on a boring mill big enough to handle passengers. Despite their size, the parts must be finished to precision tolerances, so they'll continue functioning smoothly under the terrific strains they have to take on the job. In addition to excavating, Marion machines are widely used for handling bulk materials of all kinds, especially on construction jobs and other places where extreme ruggedness and great power are required. This plant was one of the first anywhere to use an electric eye to guide an automatic burning machine in cutting a complicated part out of steel. On the erection floor, an electric shovel is assembled. The upper frame that will support the shovel cab descends onto the lower frame. The machines built here are another of those products the public never buys, but which serve the public every day by serving industry. For example, this medium-sized electric shovel may help build a dam or a highway, a factory or office building. And in mining operations of all kinds, whether it's coal, iron ore, bauxite, gypsum, gravel, or whatever, excavators of this magnitude help bring out the vital minerals we need, making possible strip mining that eliminates the need for men to spend their working days underground, while at the same time opening up deposits that would not otherwise be economical to mine. Americans enjoy the highest standard of living in the world because we have so successfully utilized power plus machines plus know-how. This combination has enabled us to increase our productivity and earn more in less time and so buy more and better products at less cost. Here we are constantly striving to raise the standard of living for all of our citizens. We know that free men with incentives can produce far more than regimented men working for the state. Therefore, we must constantly guard our freedom in order to enjoy that ever-increasing standard of living, the sure promise of the American way of life. Here's a chore that's fading fast from the American scene, scrubbing and boiling clothes to make them almost white again. Now, automatic wash machines, using improved soaps and detergents, eliminate the scrubbing and hand wringing, while our chemical industries provide bleaches that not only make boiling unnecessary, but turn out washes far whiter than ever resulted from hours of cooking. One such chemical industry is the Hylex Company of St. Paul and Denver. Here at the St. Paul plant, Raw materials like chlorine and alkalis are processed under conditions that permit careful control along with mass production. The firm has been producing its liquid bleach for more than 20 years, keeping up with the intensive competition in its field by developing ever better, more efficient, less expensive methods of turning out the product.
No company can afford to be left behind in the forward march of industrial progress. Great new demands have been made on the bleach manufacturers as a result of the invention of synthetic fabrics like nylon, orlon, dacron, and the others. In the laboratory, staff chemists went to work and developed a powdered bleach to handle just that kind of fiber. For two years before the new bleach was marketed, it was tested and retested in the lab and in washing machines in the home. A standard procedure before any new product is introduced to American housewives, who can be the most adamant in the world when it comes to a commodity that doesn't measure up to the promises made for it. Finally, it went into production, a brand new item to meet a brand new need. This is the way American industries must prove themselves day after day. They just can't come up with a good bleach for cotton, say, and then rest on their laurels. No matter what kind of fabrics Milady hangs on the line, she wants them to be white. A petroleum loading platform tank overflows and ignites. Within seconds, the flames roar high in the air as a dense cloud of smoke hampers the work of firemen who move in behind the protection of a fog spray. No, it's not a disaster in the making. In fact, this fire may prevent disasters in the future. For it was set off purposely at a fireman's training ground in Portland, Oregon, to increase the knowledge of city firemen and industrial workers on the ways of combating oil fires. A crowd is on hand for the inaugural demonstrations at the training ground, which was built and contributed to the city by the Oregon Petroleum Industries Committee. The visitors see some remarkable applications of modern firefighting techniques. Here, a piece of key equipment, represented by the sheet of paper, is protected from the flames until the fuel supply can be cut off. The paper remains intact. In the next demonstration, a drum of gasoline is heated until a jet of flame issues from the vent. Proper procedure here is to flush away the ground fire, cool off the container, then snuff out the negligible flame that remains. Just about every conceivable type of oil and gas fire is created to show the firemen, professional and non-professional alike, how each type requires its own special treatment. Gone is the day when, regardless of what kind of fire it is, you merely turn a hose on it. Do that with an oil fire, and in many cases, you're likely to make it worse. But here's a fire on an arrangement of pipes and valves known as a Christmas tree. In this case, a heavy stream of water is desirable to clear away the blazing oil on the ground beneath the Christmas tree. Then the fog spray lets the men get close enough to shut off the flow. Many are the weapons, and just as numerous are the tactics that can be used in battling fires. At this training ground sponsored by Portland Industries, it's expected that interested companies before long will provide props for instruction in all of them, helping to make Portland's fire laddies among the most effective in the nation. In America, large and small business are completely interdependent. One cannot get along without the other. This is a good system. It gets things done. It enables all of us to buy more of the good things in life at the lowest possible price. For instance, there are more than 3,000 major manufacturers of food and food products. Their success depends upon the 680,000 retail stores which sell their food to the consumer. In the petroleum industry, more than 800 refineries and natural gas plants call upon 400,000 local outlets to place their products in the hands of the public. An old New England grist mill at Sudbury, Massachusetts, grinding out whole wheat flour as in colonial days for a woman named Mrs. Margaret Rudkin. Is she a home baker turning out loaves for her family? 
Well, that's how Mrs. Rudkin started a few years ago. But the bread she made from this high gluten, high protein flour was so good, her friends started asking her to bake for them. And now the business has grown, so it takes trailer trucks to haul the flour to her Pepperidge Farm Bakery at Norwalk, Connecticut. The unbleached flour is sifted, then carried by screw drive to hoppers in the mixing room. Meanwhile, certain other elements, like milk, honey, and butter, are thoroughly mixed, and they, too, are fed by pipes to the mixing room. Here, the pre-mixed ingredients are carefully measured out, just the right amount of each for 80 loaves of bread. Last to go in is the flour. Now the dough is put on the hook, as they call it. This refers to the mixing hook that stirs the dough. It's the same sort of hook used on a home mixer and is considered superior for mixing bread ingredients. From the mixer, the dough goes to a raising room, then arrives here to be weighed out into one loaf segments and kneaded by hand in the old-fashioned way that distributes the yeast bubbles through the dough, giving the bread a smooth texture. Moving along by conveyor belt, the dough is placed in individual pans. It'll now be allowed to rise some more before going into the ovens. An arm reaches out and draws the loaves into the mechanical oven, where they stay for about an hour at a temperature of 400 degrees. Emerging gold and brown and ready for wrapping. Some, but not all of the loaves, are sliced before being wrapped. 4,000 loaves an hour can be produced on the equipment in this plant, along with great quantities of rolls, brown and serve items, poultry stuffing, and other bread products. Quite an increase over the few loaves Mrs. Rudkin baked for her friends only 15 years ago. But despite the stepped-up production, there's still a full quota of enjoyment in every slice. Industry on Parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. In his efforts to utilize more fully the products of our forests, man invented plywood. Now another major step, conversion of cores left over from veneer peeling, along with other formerly unused materials, to produce a new wood product superior in many ways to any other yet developed. At the United States Plywood Corporation plant in Anderson, California, those cores from which no more veneer could be taken are cut to manageable size, then fed into revolving blades that reduce them to flaky shavings. Actually, the precision cut flakes created here are flakes of veneer, and they'll be processed much like any veneer, welded together with a great many other flakes and wood chips to become a new kind of wood laminate called Nova Ply. 
After sawdust and particles too small to use have been screened out, the flakes go to storage silos from which they're fed as needed through a long rotary dryer for curing. Flakes and the wood chips made from plywood trimmings and other waste lumber now are thoroughly impregnated with urea resin, the substance that will bind them together. First to go into a 6x12 aluminum plate are the flakes of veneer. These will form the shimmering outer ply, or face. The plate now moves along to have the core spread on top of the face. These are the chips that make up the core. Third and final layer consists, of course, of more flakes of veneer. In a preliminary pressing, the three layers of the sandwich are forced together just enough so they'll hold their shape when they're removed from the form and sent on to the hot press. It's in the hot press that great heat and pressure will bond the wood and resin together into strong, light, hard surfaced, warp free panels of Nova Ply. Out they come, 16 at a time, only a fraction as thick as they were before. A demonstration of how tough those little chips and shavings have become may be seen in the way they're removed from the press. At this stage, the panels have rough edges that must be trimmed off. In addition, some also will be sanded to take stain or paint. However, a good many Novaply users prefer it in its natural state. And where is it used? In furniture, fixtures, cabinets, and sliding doors. or as in this seashore cottage in wall paneling, another new product with which man conserves his natural resources and improves his standard of living at the same time. As you watch industry on parade, you are witnessing free men and women producing the products you use every day of your life. Through the years, Americans have been able to outproduce every other nation in the world because we have maintained our system of free, private, competitive enterprise. And under our system, it has meant more and better products at prices we can afford to pay and a higher living standard for all. No other system, whether it be socialist or communist, has even come close to America's magnificent production record in this land of freedom. At Needham Heights, Massachusetts, and other plants of the William Carter Company, the time and work of a lot of people are going into the making of some exceedingly small garments, nightgowns, underwear, dresses, and other clothing for our very youngest citizens. Much of the firm's output is for adults, too. But today, we're concentrating on how the company turns out finery for the small fry. Here we see the smocking operation that decorates the front of a baby's dress by gathering the material at the yoke. The different parts of the dress are seamed together at the rate of 40 dresses an hour. The yoke is attached and then the sleeves are set. These fabrics were all knitted on the company's own knitting machines at its plant in Barnesville, Georgia. Newest thing in children's clothes is the blind stitch hem. It's made so the mother can easily lengthen a dress as the baby grows by simply pulling an exposed thread. And the latest in fashions for the junior junior miss is a panty that matches the dress. Elastic is inserted and the hem sewn in one operation. As the sides are seamed, the label is inserted. Then all seams are reinforced at points of extra stress. The garments are bundled only for transfer to the packaging department, for nowadays just about anything you buy has its own individual container for greater cleanliness, attractiveness, and saleability. Though confined to a wheelchair, company president William H. Carter, 88, 
is still a daily visitor to every department of the mill, accompanied by his brother, Horace Carter, executive vice president. Still very much concerned about keeping America's youngest ladies as smartly and economically dressed as their older sisters. The Chicago Post Office. Bags of mail bound for Southern Illinois by Railway Postal Service. Railway? This looks like a bus. And that's what it is. One of a fleet of buses operated by the Gulf, Mobile, and Ohio Railroad to extend rapid transportation of the mails to points not reached by its trains. The buses are operated just like the more familiar railway mail cars, with a couple of clerks busy inside sorting the letters and parcel post packages as the bus rolls along the highway. First of the 57 stops this bus will make on today's run is the airport, where airmail is picked up for towns and cities along the way. The GM and O bus also makes a train connection at Joliet further ensuring complete interlocking of the various means by which our private transportation systems keep Americans in close touch with each other, no matter how far out in the country they live. All day long, this rolling post office will call at the stationary variety to drop off mail for local citizens and pick out mail bound for other parts of the country. Elwood, Braceville, Bloomington, Shirley, Atlanta, Lawndale. Small towns, most of them, but they get their mail and the Chicago papers about as fast as Chicagoans do. Some stops really aren't stops at all. And some are unscheduled. All in a day's work for the railway mail service that took to the highways. Most Americans feel prosperous these days. We have a job, own a car, and have a comfortable home. There's a radio and television set and an electric refrigerator. In addition to all of these things, we've been able to put some money in savings accounts, insurance policies, and pension funds. We feel prosperous until we realize that inflation has cheapened our 100 cent dollar in the last dozen years until today, it's worth only 52 cents. The way to halt further inflation and build a sound, healthy dollar is to increase production and insist that our government economize, cut extravagance, and put the federal budget on a pay-as-we-go basis. Cowboy boots pounding a pavement in Texas. Almost standard footwear for all occasions in these parts. And one of the standard names in the boot-making industry is that of H.J. Justin & Sons of Fort Worth, whose plant we visit in order to watch some of the 126 operations that go into the manufacture of a genuine cowboy boot. Here we see how a decorative design is marked on the leather. The marked vamps and boot tops now go to another room, where skilled operators stitch the design into the leather with various colored silk threads. On a crimping machine, the boot vamp is curved to fit the contours of the foot. It's also pre-stretched in this process, so it won't stretch out of shape later. Vamp and top are cemented together, and vamp lining also is glued on. Each part is made of a different kind of leather because of the unique function it will serve. Four or five kinds of leather are used in every pair of quality cowboy boots. Two pieces that form the upper are joined here, with a strip of leather reinforcing the seam. Straps used in pulling the boot on the foot are glued in place before being sewed. Up to this point, the uppers have been inside out. Here's how they're turned to expose only flawless stitches with no dangling threads. Now the time has come to start shaping the boot around the last. 
a piece of wood shaped like the human foot. There are different lasts, of course, for all the varying foot sizes. Steaming softens the leather so that it can be snugly formed around the sharp toe of the last. Although boots with ordinary toes are made here, greatest demand seems to be for the pointed toe, and the sharper, the better. Heel lasting is a similar operation. A strip of leather called the welt is sewed between the upper and the insole, with an edge protruding to which the outer sole can be sewed. But before the sawing, again, the leather is glued together. Prior to this step, a steel shank has been placed in the arch of the boot. The glue between the sole and the bottom of the boot will help make it as nearly waterproof as possible. Here, the sole gets a rough trim before being stitched. A leveling machine removes any wrinkles and makes the boot conform to the shape of the wooden last that's still inside. The machine doesn't quite reach the sole arch, so they take care of that with a hammer. And then the boot goes into a heel machine. Nails go into a holder on top. Down it comes and the heel is ready for sanding. There are a great many additional steps to be taken before the boots are ready to be worn. Final trimming of the sole, staining, polishing, dressing. A lot of time, skill, and expensive materials go into a pair, but because of their comfort and the real Western feeling they give, a growing number of Texans and other Americans wouldn't wear anything else. Industry on Parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. and Whitney Aircraft Plant at East Hartford, Connecticut, world's largest airplane engine factory, source of some of the greatest advances in aircraft propulsion and currently engaged in a tremendous expansion of its defense production facilities, plays host to a group of New England newspaper editors. They've come to learn a little about the engines that give America its supremacy in the air. From all the talk about jets, you might imagine the piston engine to be a thing of the past. But it was piston engines that delivered every man and ton of material flown to Korea. And it's the piston-powered B-36 that's still the only plane capable of delivering the atom bomb anywhere on Earth. So Pratt & Whitney is still plenty busy producing the cylinders and other parts for piston engines like the 3,500 horsepower Wasp Major. But as they work on propeller driving engines with the power of diesel locomotives, the firm at the same time pushes ahead in the jet field and has come up with the J-57 jet engine as far ahead in its field as the Wasp Major. Production figures are of course classified information. But in World War II, Pratt & Whitney Aircraft and its licensees built half of all U.S. horsepower flown in the war. As fast as a new engine comes into production, an improved version or a new model moves toward completion on the drawing boards. But since an airplane is only as good as its engines, it's that constant search for improvement by the aircraft industry that's helped make our position in the air as strong as it is today. Being assembled here are Pratt & Whitney J-48 turbojets, 
power plants for some of our fastest jet fighters. These are the afterburner assemblies, which, when joined to the turbine assemblies, can send planes through space at the speed of sound. On the existence of planes like these may depend our chances for survival. To the men who fly them and the men who make them, more power to you. A family can spend more than it earns only so long, and then it will go broke. Our government has spent more than it took in through taxes for 19 out of the past 21 years. Because our government spent more than it earned, we have dangerous inflation. In 1939, we had a 100 cent dollar. Inflation has cut its value to 54 cents today. Now, this chipping away at our dollar must stop. It can stop if the government balances the budget, slices all unnecessary spending, and adopts a sound tax policy to pay as we go for all essential spending, including defense needs. All over the country, as America's working man turns to at the job of building a mighty defense machine while maintaining our civilian economy, this is the uniform of the day. Overalls, in this case, Lee overalls. Industry on Parade travels to Kansas City and H.D. Lee and Company, dropping in on President R.B. Kaywood as he confers with his top executives on ways and means of maintaining top production schedules. Making overalls begins where the manufacture of other garments does, on the cutting tables. But instead of dainty silk or nylon, the spreading machines here lay out tough, sturdy denim, 120 thicknesses of it. The patterns are laid on top, and it's amazing how many separate parts there are to a pair of overalls. All 120 layers are cut at once. On a variety of machines, the highly skilled operators assemble the various parts. These will be pockets. Gradually, the overalls take shape. Lee also makes other work clothes of all kinds, including the work clothes of the men of the armed forces. The pants legs are put together. Rust-proof rivets reinforce points where there'll be extra strain. Last on are the buckles for the shoulder straps and the overalls are complete, ready to clothe the men who handle the ruggedest jobs in the land. Though you won't find them being worn on Park Avenue, these days the man in overalls buys only with the man in uniform for the title, Best Dressed in the Land. The four-foot blade of a friction saw knifes through a sheet of steel as easily as your corner butcher slices cold cuts. We're at the new plant of the Brown Wales Company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a firm that serves somewhat the same purpose as that butcher. For just as the butcher takes the side of beef or pork from the big packer and prepares just the kind of cut required by the individual family, so does Brown Wales cater to the special needs of industries, requiring steel and other metals in limited quantities. Sheets, plates, bars, in a wide variety of forms, the metal comes from the mills to be stored in bays until needed. From the general offices to the superintendent of the warehouse, pneumatic tubes bring the orders to be filled. So many bars of a certain size, so many sheets cut to a certain pattern. The new plant is equipped with every imaginable facility for storing, shaping, and handling large pieces of metal. For example, this steel is headed for a shear that can cut steel up to half an inch thick. A powerful sheet lifter not only is the most versatile ever built, but also the safest. 
That's important in a branch of industry that once had a high accident rate. Oxygen and acetylene flame cutting equipment is guided over a pattern drawn on paper by an electronic tracing device. Not only does this give a much more accurate cut than would be possible if the cutter were guided by hand, but many cutters can be operated simultaneously, all following the same electronic tracer. Notice the clean, sharp edge left by the flame. Hardly any burr at all is left behind. Brown Wales takes pride in its ability to supply just about any size, shape, or design called for by its customers. Like other steel warehouses, it demonstrates the need in our complex economy for firms that specialize just as individuals do, rendering an important service in keeping the goods flowing from producer to consumer. Despite its impressive appearance, the Brown Wales plant is really just an efficient store, supplying the needs of the community like a corner grocery. All of us can thank American industrial know-how for our ability to produce man-made rubber as amply and as good as nature. In the past, our rubber has come from the tropics, gathered by natives from millions of rubber trees. Today, after relentless research at the cost of millions, American factories occupying only a few city blocks produce synthetically as much rubber as thousands of tropical acres. That means greater self-sufficiency in defense production. And in the firms making 50,000 different rubber products, it means many times that number of jobs for American employees. Every soldier defending our freedoms on a foreign battlefield must go tons of equipment to keep him in action. And thanks to the good work of a unique organization called the American Bible Society, our fighting men receive not only the clothing, ammunition, and other equipment they need, but something equally important to many, a copy of the Holy Bible, the most widely distributed book in history. At plants like that of the World Publishing Company in Cleveland, one of many suppliers of the American Bible Society, scriptures are produced in much different fashion than when they were laboriously turned out by hand centuries ago. And yet, even with the hundreds of millions of copies that have already come off the presses, the need for still more copies is felt everywhere on earth. Industry on Parade sets out to see how a book is put together, and what better book than this? The pages are collected into sections of the book called signatures. Actually, each signature includes the pages that will go into two books. They'll be cut apart later. The signatures are assembled on a gathering machine that puts them together so that each page will be in its proper place. Now we have half a book, or rather, the halves of two books. Next step, is to sew the signatures together with a thread that's very fine, but strong and durable enough to last for years. The three outside edges are now trimmed off. Here's an operation most books don't go through, gilding the edges. As the books are held tight in a vise, an expert places gold leaf, pure gold, hammered thinner than the thinnest paper on the glued edges. Burnishing with agate stone brings out a high luster. The vise table is opened and the books are broken and fanned. Now they're ready for the covers that have been in the process of assembly in another department. Covers come in as many different materials as there are page sizes, but the ones we see being made are a traditional favorite, Morocco. The American Bible Society has distributed more than 400 million Bibles during its long history, not only to troops, but to people in every walk of life. 
The good book has been printed in more than a thousand languages, but the Society's aim is to bring it out in another thousand. The title and other words to go on the cover are pressed into the leather again in gold. So pages and cover are now complete and ready to be joined together. Here's how that's done. Some editions are very ornate, with zippers for the cover. But to men who read their Bible under conditions like these, the appearance of the book means nothing. It's what's inside that counts. <laughs>